Hi everybody, it's Camille. Got a question today brought to you by one of my students who wanted to know how urea is formed and excreted in the liver. So let's talk about this. First of all, what is urea? Uh, voila, there it is. <laughs> Does that solve all your problems? Uh, so one thing I want you to observe about urea right here is that it's got a lot of nitrogen in it, relatively speaking. So you've got these two separate amine groups in it. And urea is the end product of nitrogen metabolism. And where do we get nitrogen? We primarily get nitrogen from amino acids that enter the body. So the big question is, if we're trying to get rid of nitrogen and it enters the body as amino acids, how do we get from amino acids, how do we get that nitrogen from amino acids into the form of urea? All right, so let's talk about that. Um, we have to answer a sub-question first before we address the big question, which is where is all of this happening? And how do we primarily get amino acids into the body? Where does our where does our protein mostly come from? Hopefully, you answered uh, from the diet, <laughs> right? So when we eat protein, when we eat foods that have proteins in them, these proteins are essentially just long chains of amino acids. So each one of these little circles here is meant to um, depict an amino acid. And the whole point of digestion of the proteins is to break down these long chains into primarily single amino acids. So we have pepsin in the stomach, we've got uh, proteases from, secreted from the pancreas into the small intestine, and those are all enzymes that basically chop these, chop this chain up so that we can absorb single amino acids into the bloodstream in the, from the small intestine. Now, where does all of the blood from the small intestine go after after it leaves the digestive area. Hopefully you remembered, and maybe you were cued by this lovely picture right here, hopefully you remember that it goes to, to the liver first because the liver screens essentially everything coming from the digestive tract before it circulates to the rest of the body. So the liver is, is what's handling all of these amino acids that are coming in. And normally the liver does a lot of repackaging of amino acids because the liver builds a lot of proteins in and of itself it builds proteins that are structural it can build proteins that travel in the blood like c-reactive protein and all, all sorts of things um, however we can't store excess proteins this is a little bit different from carbohydrates and fats right because both of those macronutrients um, if we have if we eat more than we need at the current time we can store them away for later Proteins doesn't, that doesn't work like that. So we don't have a way to store proteins. So once the liver, you know, if, if it doesn't need all of the proteins that we're eating, which is normally the case, then it has nothing else to do with them. And so we need to somehow get rid of these excess, excess amino acids so that they don't just um, kind of hang out there in the hepatocytes. And that is what we're gonna talk about now. So how do we go from amino acids to urea? And again, this is largely happening in the liver, although we'll discuss um, other cells in a little bit here. So the first thing that you wanna do is deaminate the amino acid. So what we have here, um, what we have here is a generic amino acid. Of course, the R refers to the rest of the molecule. So that'll be different depending on what amino acid it is. But we have enzymes that essentially clip off this amine group right here and one other hydrogen. And the reason that that's the first step is because everything else in this amino acid can be used to create carbohydrates or fats. So the rest of it is very easy for the liver to deal with, but this nitrogen part is the problematic part. So we clip that one off with an enzyme first. Step two is um, panic, not maybe not explicitly, but uh, then we have a problem on our hands because what we're left with is NH3. So that amine group plus one extra hydrogen equals ammonia, all right, NH3, which is shown here. And ammonia is highly toxic to the body. And uh, buildup of even relatively small amounts of ammonia in the blood cause things like coma and convulsions. Okay, so not a good thing, not ideal. So we have to figure out something else to do with this ammonia after we have clipped it off of the amino acids. And that's where the urea cycle comes in. <laughs> now, before you panic, we are not going into the biochemistry of the urea cycle in this lecture. There's actually a number of YouTube videos and other places where this is explained pretty well. Um, we're, we'll go over the big picture. But the urea cycle is essentially a way to take ammonia and make it into 
something less toxic. And this, this cycle only happens in the hepatocytes, the cells of the liver. And the reason it only happens there is because those are the only cells in the body that we know of that have all of the enzymes necessary to run this cycle. And if you just look at this, you can see that there's quite a number of enzymes that are needed to make this whole thing go. So anytime you're in a hepatocyte and you've got excess ammonia coming in, and when, uh, you also have to have some carbon dioxide and some ATP, but anytime all three of those are present and you've got the enzymes here, you can run this cycle and essentially neutralize the, in the non-chemistry sense, uh, you can take care of the ammonia by making it into urea. A cool side note is that this cycle happens both inside the mitochondria, as shown in this top part, and outside the mitochondria. So um, it's really moving through space as it goes through the cycle. So the big picture of the urea cycle, without going through each individual step, is that you're going to start with ammonia, carbon dioxide, and ATP, and you're going to wind up with urea and ADP. And then you, in the process of this cycle, you regenerate ornithine, which is why this cycle is also called the ornithine cycle sometimes. And again, as a reminder, here is a mo um, here is urea, which you can see is basically, you've got two nitrogen groups or two amine groups here, and here is the um, essentially what's left of the carbon dioxide. And the good news about urea is that it's not nearly as toxic as ammonia. In fact, in, at physiological levels, it's not a problem at all. And the other good news about it is that it's water soluble. And whenever you're trying to excrete something, having it be water soluble is uh, lovely. <laughs> because step four is that the urea formed in the, in the hepatocytes can travel through the bloodstream and uh, get excreted by the kidneys. And um, in fact, urea is one of the main drivers of urine formation in terms of um, kind of balance, water, creating osmolarity and um, water balance in the kidneys, which is of course a story for a different day. But that's essentially what is happening. So that's how we take amino acids and get the nitrogen from the amino acid all the way into urea and pee it out. And you can see that if we don't do that, we wind up with ammonia building up in the system. So the next question some people have is, well, does this only happen in the liver? Like if, what about other cells um, that might be also um, kind of dealing with amino acids? And this is a great question because certainly the liver gets the most exposure to new amino acids from the diet, but other almost every other cell in the body is fiddling around with amino acids, building and breaking down proteins all the time. Um, structural proteins, we've got channels, um, all kinds of different uh, things being produced by each individual cell. The good news is that most of the time these cells can just recycle the amino acids that they break down and reuse them. So they don't wind up with a huge excess of um, amine groups that they can't use. They just you know, kind of rework them. Um, however, sometimes these cells do wind up with excess and they don't have, because they're not hepatocytes, they don't have those enzymes needed to run the urea cycle. So what are these cells supposed to do to get rid of any kind of ammonia buildup? And here is, here is my um, somewhat woefully inadequate depiction of what's happening. Um, so before we start this, you might see here we have NH4+, and we previously said ammonia was NH3. So I just want to clarify this and point out that um, ammonia is NH3, ammonium is NH4+, and those two exist in a dynamic equilibrium. Primarily, um, ammonia is going to travel in the blood as NH4+, as in the form of a salt. Um, but you'll kind of hear both of them talked about collectively as ammonia, although officially just NH3 is ammonia. Anyway, so if you're a, just a regular old cell, not a hepatocyte, and you don't have the enzymes for the urea cycle, what you do have is alpha-ketoglutarate. And that is um, an intermediate in the Krebs cycle. It's, uh, you know, needed to run, to form ATP and so on and so forth. So this is abundant in in just regular old cells. And so what you can do is actually add an ammonium group to that and form glutamate and add another ammonium group and form glutamine, right? So here we've got one, two ammonia, um, one, two amine groups here. And then glutamine can travel in the blood and the liver can deal with that, break it down and run it through the urea cycle. So basically this is just transporting these ammonium groups to the liver in the blood so that the liver can turn it into urea. Now, um, the very last point before we wrap this lecture up <laughs> is that um, 
some people have questions about the toxicity of ammonia, right? And though it's actually somewhat of a mystery why it's so toxic to the body when it, again, it builds up in very small amounts and starts to cause coma and convulsions. And the, it's such a small amount that we don't think it's actually causing a, um, differences in pH balance, that it's not a pH mediated effect. And there's a couple of different ideas about what might be going on. One of them is that this reaction right here, this um, alpha ketoglutarate to glutamate is reversible. And so if you've got excess <clears throat> ammonia, it's gonna start driving the reaction this way towards glutamate and using up alpha ketoglutarate. And so there's been speculation that perhaps if we're using up all the alpha ketoglutarate, that the Krebs cycle can't run efficiently. Um, so that is one, one, um, one possible issue. Um, and there's, you know, there's some other ones. Uh, there's also the idea that ammonia might somehow be mimicking potassium ions and thus um, kind of getting into areas where they shouldn't be getting and causing other uh, of their upsets within the cells. But you know, it's, a, it's an interesting, um, it's an, that's an interesting question for deliberation. In any case, just to wrap up, so what we have is we've got our um, We've got our amino acids primarily um, coming in from, from dietary sources, but anytime in any cell where you have more amino acids than you immediately need, you're gonna have to break down the amino acid. To do that, you clop, you, you clop off an amine group and that becomes ammonia, which is toxic. So uh, either you change it into glutamine and send it to the liver, or if you already are in the liver, you can run that ammonia through the urea cycle, produce urea, and the urea can then travel in the blood to the kidney and get excreted. All right, I hope that was helpful. Let me know if you have any questions and I'll talk to you soon.